above the minimum standards, but you have to do so sensibly. You just can't do that just for the sake of doing it or to try to game the system. You have to do it sensibly with a view to ensure that you craft an ML safety regime that is consistent with, your, with, with the risks that you have. If you think you only have 30 lawyers who, who are all doing real estate transactions, that's fine. You can, you can bring the, the level down. But if, in fact, you have over 1,000 lawyers, then obviously you have to redesign the system. So you can achieve super compliance or gold plating sensibly in the way in which you uh, conceptualize and articulate what type of ML safety regime you have. Uh, cognizant of the time as well, I should mention to you that, and I'm reading specifically from the methodology, there may be exceptional circumstances in which assessors conclude that there is a low level of technical compliance, but nevertheless, a certain level of effectiveness. So I'll leave you to cogitate on that one. But essentially, what FATF is telling their assessors, or uh, at least applicable from 2014, is that even if you encounter, when you encounter a, a country in which there is a low level of compliance, that is not the end of it. They may be in a position where they have a highly effective system, but it's just a low level of compliance with what our recommendations state. The final, the final pillars that I will touch on are the need for national coordination and partnership among all the entities, particularly the financial institutions. And if during the Q&A a question comes up with respect to financial institutions, I'll explain that in a little bit more in terms of the context of what is being looked for, what, what is being asked uh, for there. The need for, the second is the need for financial institutions to work locally, but to think globally, because they're part of the global network. Another one is to avoid falling into what I call the big boys trap, which is to think that because the, the, the larger, more sophisticated countries in the world, the US and, 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 and the UK and Canada can get away with things that you can try it too, that just wouldn't work. Even though there's sufficient empirical evidence, in fact, there's a study by um, some professors, Nielsen and Shaman, who found that they were looking for shell companies. And they found that the countries that actually led the world with the ease of being able to set up shell companies well, shell companies are those companies that, through which you can do illegal, a lot of, uh, transact a lot of illegal financial business, uh, to which it's, from which it's difficult to trace ownership. But they found that the countries in the world that had the biggest opportunity to establish shell companies uh, were in fact the US and, uh, and, and, and uh, Canada and, and so on. And they, they recently updated that study, but the point is made simply that it, it is possible that you may fall into the trap of thinking that because it's done in the bigger countries, you can do it too. There's also a need for awareness and communication that facilitates transparency and builds on credibility, and a need for international cooperation to close the gaps that can be exploited by opportunists. I'm looking at all the headlines here. In the interest of time, I'm looking at that, and then we can deal with them during the Q&A. There's also a need to close the avenues for corruption. And here's where I'm going to tickle your brains as well again. This time we'll do some maths. No, sorry. We'll do a formula. So that's the corruption formula right there. Corruption is equal to monopoly plus discretion minus accountability minus salary plus I plus LOD plus LOS plus LOG. Where here, as you see there, I is ignorance of the rules by the public. LOD is lack of discipline by the public. LOS, lack of scruples by the public, who would rather do what is convenient and what is right, and happy to pay a bribe uh, for what they're not entitled, with no consideration given to the wider picture and the position of other people. LOG, I like LOG, lack of guts by the public. When they're submissive, when facing someone perceived to be superior to them, they can set themselves up for exploitation. I'm not going to get too much into corruption, except to tell you that FATF is now making a, 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 a serious effort to have its, its uh, recommendations that I mentioned earlier be used in the fight against corruption. Why that's important? Because corruption is so pervasive that it is in every single country of the world. And Guyana, though some may disagree with me, Guyana, what Guyana is experiencing is actually a, a convergence of a number of forces that do not help us to print a pretty picture in the context of developing an effective AML CFT regime. 
And this is one aspect of it that we're going to have to tackle. The existence and, and, uh, and, and difficulty of corruption. So now I come to, I promise you that at the, close to the end of the presentation, I'll be able to touch on countermeasures and blacklisting. I'm also going to give you the highlights here. But before I do that, just let me mention quickly some of the other elements of, practical elements I call them, of effective AML safety regimes that I think you should think about. If you're a student in here, for instance, and you want to think, well, you know, if you want to be intellectual about it, here are a few others that you can think about. That the FIU should be a member of Egmont, of Egmont sorry. That there must be appropriate legislative support, particularly budgetary support. There must be executive support. There must be judicial support. I mean, I'm using these as headlines, but if you were to ask me during the Q&A, I can give you examples. If a judge, for instance, sees or is faced with a transaction where uh, there is a request, uh, an application before the court to rule on a matter, say, for instance, let's take a, a, a purchase of a house. The two parties are fighting over a house. And one says, you promised to sell me the house, and the other says, no, I changed my mind. And he says, you promised to sell me the house for $30 million. He says, I changed my mind because the values went up. And all of a sudden, the purchaser decides, you know what, Your Honor, um, I would like to increase um, the offer. Uh, you know, I'd like to pay, I'd like to offer $100 million for this house. And the judge says, okay, well, that will dispose of the matter. Yes, of course, you can pay him $100 million. That may very well be a money laundering transaction. That is simply receiving the blessing of the court. And unbeknownst to everyone in the court, that could just happen right before your eyes. And an order is made that legitimizes it. And so the person who is the seller can say, look, I sold my house for $100 million. But your house was only really only worth $30 million. What you've managed to do, what the purchaser and the seller managed to do, was essentially wash $70 million through the courts. So when I speak of uh, judicial support, in terms of determining effectiveness, that's, a, that's a, one example. So I don't want you to leave and think, well, that's the way it works in Guyana or anything else. I'm just saying that's an example, and I chose an exaggerated example as well to sensationalize it for you so that you kind of get the picture. So when I say judicial support, that's what I mean, uh, that the judges are cognizant, and that, and that in some cases, like Nigeria has a special court to deal with um, email safety and other financial crimes. Well, we, I don't think we're going to get there. We have a commercial court. But the point is that it, that's possible. And I believe it's an essential element for effective regimes. Um, essentially, there must also be what I call data protection laws, a system for that. There must be appropriate training and appropriate use of intelligence, intelligence in criminal investigation. The FIU, for instance, that we have locally is, 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 is the gatherer of information. It does not have a prosecutorial role or an investigative role. So you have to understand the position of the FIU in that context. It has a, it has a limited role. Oops, sorry, TVG. There must be a, what I also call a strong regulatory compliance culture. And this is important because this is a soft issue. This is something we don't speak of often enough. As a people, we have to take responsibility and learn to respect uh, rules. There must also be a robust regime for, com for countermeasures. Um, uh, for existing high-risk countries that want to deal with you. And lastly, there must be what I call the humility to learn from others. There is no country in the world that we can't learn something from. I chose Malawi, for instance, in that example. I could have chosen any other country, but I chose Malawi for those peculiar reasons. You know, the opposition was in parliament when they made their amendments and when they also passed through, um, uh, amend, um, when they passed additional, when they did additional work for the 2006 Act. Uh, they have this, this public accounts committee that, that oversees the FIU. The FIU has a, a lifespan, can't be removed except for, you know, those things are important. You can learn from other jurisdictions in terms of the way you go about designing your regime for effectiveness. Now, what happens when, um, when compliance fails? The point I should make, and I made earlier when I mentioned soft law, is that CF FATF does not have the power to sanction. But what they do have it's a power to take, a graduate, to take a graduated approach to progressively enhance peer pressure against non-compliant institutions. Uh, they used to do it by having progress reports at every plenary and then a visit by the FATF president or, or high level mission, and then what's called an adverse public statement. What Guyana has received, uh, not many people know, is actually an adverse, from CFATF, sorry, is an adverse public statement. They can also be neutral public statements or they can be 
It's public statements that are not adverse, but we have had uh, two adverse public statements. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then ultimately, there could be suspension to an, of a non-compliant territory. Which brings me to the issue of uh, blacklisting. And the reason why, personally, I don't like the word uh, blacklisting, I should mention as well, uh, is because FATF does not use it. Quite simply, they don't use it. Uh, they use other very nuanced uh, 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 cultural language to describe exactly this, uh, the, the status of a country, and I respect that. But I also understand that when in Rome, does the Romans do? And so it's a colloquial expression that you use to communicate the status of a country that has been listed and against, against which there has been an adverse public statement. So it is in that context that I use it tonight. Not on the protest, but as I'm just giving you context and also educating you on the use of the word itself. Um, so, blacklisting, however, is the official name for it is naming and shaming, and there are a number of, um, it's part of a menu of measures that can be taken, not only by FATF, but also other uh, uh, similarly situated uh, organizations. There is, for instance, uh, conditionality, Office of Financial Assistance, subject to conditions. For instance, you say, unless you pass your MLCFT legislation, we're not going to lend you money. That's conditionality. Uh, capital market sanctions, which include special rest restrictions or outright prohibitions on countries, and their membership-specific sanctions, which can include suspensions, and then, of course, naming and shaming. Naming and shaming, or blacklisting, I'll use blacklisting for convenience, um, followed by public statements, uh, uh, countermeasures, and other reputational market and other sanctions, is rooted in the idea that a country, not an individual or a political party, but a country does not have the intended commitment to adhere to international MLCFT standards evidenced by the FATF recommendations. So when you display lack of intent and lack of commitment, you may end up sliding down that slippery slope. And the need to, to name a chain was simply to reduce the vulnerability of those countries exhibit, uh, uh, sorry, I'm spawning uh, what's called toxic risks to the rest of the financial system. So it was a, a containment measure. And this started in, in, in 1996 with Turkey. Uh, this even happened to the Vatican, by the way. Uh, it originated in 2000. I'm just going to give you a sort of brief history here. Uh, it originated in 2000, and then it sort of blew up after 9-11. After uh, the original countries listed have all made it off that list. Um, in different years, I was going to actually bring the table to show you, but I thought it might be too much information. And that coincided at the time with tax-related listing and uh, tax, evasive, uh, tax evasion evading countries listed by the OECD. So essentially, that's where it started, but FATF has since taken all the momentum and carried on the, the idea of adverse public statements and, and listings, adverse listings. We can come back to some of this in the Q&A, but I'll just sort of fast track into saying that the process usually is based on, we mentioned earlier, mutual evaluation, and then there's an in-depth review, and then the way FATF does it currently, around which there's loads of misunderstanding, the way they do it currently is the issue, this is FATF, not CFATF, FATF. Uh, two public documents, one of which is a public statement, and the other one, you get, so you go on a, you, after you've received, after there's been an adverse public statement issued against you, you appear on a certain list, and then you graduate up the list depending on non-compliance. Uh, the next list is if you're improving global MSC, MSC, CFT compliance. You know what the public statement does? I can actually, um, I will actually show you Guyana's public statement. And, um, but first, I just wanted to touch on the impact of blacklisting and countermeasures. This is Guyana's first uh, adverse public statement issued in November. This is the second. And this is as it, as it appears on FATF's website with the applicable disclaimer that, that it does not constitute an official endorsement by FATF. Uh, however, contains relevant information that countries in the private sector's part of implementation of risk-based approach should be aware of. Another name for, for naming and shaming is also adverse speech acts. So I know there's been a lot of debate about whether Guyana is blacklisted or whether or not. I'm not going to get into that. But I will say that, that 
it's important, it's critically important, regardless of who you are, whether you're a professor, a reporter, a teacher, or someone just curious, that you track the language used in those public statements, that you track the language carefully. And some of it is sometimes pretty nuanced. If you look at this, for instance, you can just dismiss it and say, oh yes, they're saying, you know, da 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 But take a look at this. CFATF calls its members to consider implementing further countermeasures. Got that? Now look at this. Members are therefore called upon to implement further countermeasures. That's the same statement. I'm not going to try to explain it any further, but I'm just going to draw that to your attention, just out of curiosity, to show you why it's important to really pay attention to what's being said. One part of the statement said considers, the other part says to implement. So the critical thing is that you take the worst of what's said. So at the moment, it's these words that really apply, but it's for you to make what you want of it. Don't say that I have made a pronouncement on CFATS statement. I'm just telling you why it's important to pay attention uh, to those words. The area that I want to deal with is this area called countermeasures. This is the area I want to deal with next. I have a lot of content on listing and naming and shaming and so on, but I, I understand that soon you're going to get very hungry and tired of me as well. And this is all dry and boring stuff. So I'll get into countermeasures so that we can uh, at least uh, try to wrestle that beast to the ground. And the reason why I want to touch on countermeasures is because to me it's an area that is very, very little understood. Uh, uh, and you can read it, can you? Countermeasures entail, among others, requirement of enhanced due diligence, blah, 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 introducing enhanced reporting mechanisms. This is a cause for concern because this generates a lot of sensationalism on which I am not going to offer any pronouncement. Whether what any newspaper says or any person says, any person, whether uh, political or academic or intellectual, whatever, I'm not going to make a pronouncement, but I'm going to bring to your attention, and you get lucky because you're in this room, an opportunity to see firsthand how, where some of this language originates and the context within which it is developed and what this literally means. So if you're a business person and you, and you saw a statement and the extrapolation in different uh, media outlets and you're still left wondering, uh, after what I'm about to do, you shouldn't be left wondering, right? So if you had a chance to read that, right? Okay, great. So the point I'm going to make is that um, here we go? Oh, examples of consequences of money laundering. Okay, that's the wrong, not the wrong slide, but I don't want to go there quite yet. Okay, right here we go. Remember, I mentioned the recommendations earlier. You remember that the FATF recommendations? Well, here is one that deals with high-risk countries. And I'm using this by way of example, because I'm pretty sure that this is what was considered in terms of the design of that public statement for Guyana and the mention of those words, come to measures. Now, do you remember those things that were listed as come to measures? I'll ask you to see if you see how many of them you see here. So let's read this first, because this is the recommendation here. And then each recommendation, each of the four recommendations has what's called an interpretive note. So the recommendation simply stated and an interpretive note explains how the recommendation should be essentially interpreted. So here it is. Financial institutions should be required to apply enhanced due diligence measures, you see that? To business relationships and transactions with natural and legal persons and financial institutions from countries for which this is called for by the FATF. The type of enhanced due diligence measures applied should be effective and proportionate to the risk. I repeat that, effective and proportionate to the risk. Countries should be able to apply appropriate competent measures when called upon to do so by the FATF. Countries should also be able to apply competent measures independently of any call by the FATF to do so, which means that any country, the US for instance at the moment, can decide they'd like to take competent measures against Guyana if FATF had issued an adverse public statement. FATF has not yet issued an adverse public statement. CFATF has to its members. So any CFATF member at the moment, for instance, Trinidad, Tobago, Antigua, Barbados, they can choose to take an independent, uh, to apply independent countermeasures against Guyana. It's there. And also, this is the part I really want to pay attention to, effective or proportionate to the risks. 
It's not mentioned in the statement, but what I'm giving you here is an education on how that aspect of the counter measures is to be interpreted. I'm sorry for sounding like I'm lecturing, but it's really important for you to understand the background to that, so you have context to what's in the public statement. Now let's quickly just go down some of the, um, some, some of the ones, and you, you just tell me how many you see here. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna go through each one, but if you can read them, you'll see essentially, I can tell you, that they mirror that the first three or four appear on the FATF public statement, but that there are others. Do you remember the, F the FATF, CFATF public, public statement, sorry, said including? So this is the full list, right? It said including, and it mentioned about three or four. So this is just food for thought. And this is uh, recommendation 19. Now, there's a background to this that's also important for you to understand. And if you're discerning, if you're intellectual, you want to get into it, and you want to, I leave you to wrestle with that, but I just mentioned this to you, which is very important, because I'm not sure where else in Ghana this will be done. This is the original report in 2000 that the FATF prepared, um, uh, guidance that they prepared for NCCT, that is non-cooperative countries and territories. Those that received the worst adverse listing and those that people consider to be truly blacklisted. And in this, in this, this is 2000, it's, it was revised in 2007, and now the recommendation 19 that I just showed you appears in the 2013 recommendations. So it has gone through some processes, but there are just two aspects of it I want to show you. Well, yeah, two aspects of it. Well, three I'll mention. The first is that this is the first document to officially list countermeasures that FATF, FATF can take against it, it can, can invite its members to take against a non-compliant um, jurisdiction. Uh, the first of the two, of the other two points I'd like to mention to you is that, um, oops, sorry. Okay, that line there. Can you see that? FDF members, we therefore develop new type of countermeasures to better protect their financial systems and economies against money of unlawful origin. Collective and coordinated action by FATF members is clear and most desirable and should be pursued whenever possible. However, individual members could ultimately make decisions on whether to implement countermeasures on an independent basis, and then the following countermeasures should be applied according to the gravity, the gravity of the identified deficiencies. The second I want to bring your attention to, oops, not quite, not quite Vincent. Let's just go back here. The second I'd like to bring your attention to is in C. The last one's three, right there. Such measures could serve as an ultimate recourse should a country or authority have decided to, pres to, to preserve laws or practices that are practically damaging, particularly damaging for the fight against money laundering. In the event that there is no legal basis for taking these measures, FTF members should consider adopting relevant legislation. What does that tell you? If you're discerning, that would tell you that there was some concern in 2000 as to whether or not some of the countermeasures called uh, available to members were capable of being legally adopted without a specific law in the country that was taking the action. So that is an additional consideration. I'm just throwing this out there. And why that is important is because as you consider the context of countermeasures and the context of what it takes to have an effective anti money laundering regime, you remember when I listed the, the pillars, one I mentioned was that you should have, for your, your, for your regime to be considered um, effective, you should have mechanisms for, uh, that give you the ability effectively to, take, to undertake countermeasures. So it all ties back to effectiveness. So when you think about the concept of effective anti money laundering regimes, and you think about what is happening to Guyana, what has happened recently, consider the possibility that um, there, there, there are variations, uh, there, there's a wide variety of consequences that we face, or, or, or repercussions, maybe another word, or impacts, uh, four of which could be, and it's not an exhaustive list, but, but, it, but uh, you know, sort of quadruple whammy, uh, four of which could be the consequences of the current or existing MLCFT regime deficiencies. In other words, what weaknesses are currently undermining the integrity of, your, of our financial system? Uh, 
lose it, cause us to lose tax, re tax revenue, undermining the legitimate private sector, what systems are non-compliant and ineffective and therefore creating those problems. The second of the four would be the impact of the adverse public statement and computer measures. My impact, I mean reputational impact, financial impact, all of those countries